These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. I will praise the Lord of Wisdom, solicitous God, furious in the night, calming in the daylight. Thus opens one of the most powerful philosophical poems of the old Babylonian period, Ludl Bel Nemeki, usually titled in English as the Poem of the Righteous Sufferer, or Ludl for short. Often compared to the much later Jewish work, the Book of Job, Ludl asks the question, why do bad things happen to good people? The poem was frequently copied and studied in its own time for its literary qualities, the poetic and carefully structured phrasing, which is sadly almost impossible to convey through translation. But there is still plenty of literary merit, as well as philosophical interest, in the Ludl to be worth a good look. The poem itself is structured in many ways like a hymn of propitiation, a very common genre of religious prayer in which the supplicant would ask their god for some favor or to lift some suffering, but builds on that genre in a very self-aware fashion to tell the story of a man who is suffering through no faults of his own and who eventually finds redemption in the mercy of the god Marduk. It is no spoiler to say that, for the Babylonians, the answer to the problem of evil in the world was that the gods did whatever they want, and all a human can do is behave well and hope for the best. But as we will see, this broad outline only gets at one aspect of Babylonian religious belief. The date of composition is highly uncertain. Looking at just the style of Akkadian it's written in would put it somewhere around 1600 BCE, plus or minus a century or two. There are some reasons to think it might be as young as the Kassite period, but we'll see, even if this is the case, the scribes of the Kassite period innovated very little from the Old Babylonian period. We also don't know who the author was, though the narrator's name is given as Shubshi Mashra Shikan. And while there is no reason to think this isn't the author's name, there's no real reason to think it is either. Not that we know anything about him separate from the work in either case. Structurally, Ludl is four tablets of 120 lines each, though chunks of the third and fourth tablet are missing. Still, we can read through most of it and get a good enough sense of what's going on. It begins with a hymn of praise for the god Marduk, with the narrator having gone through his suffering and come out the other side with renewed faith for the high god. I will praise the Lord of Wisdom, solicitous god, furious in the night, calming in the daylight. Marduk, Lord of Wisdom, solicitous god, furious in the night, calming in the daylight whose anger engulfs like a tempest, whose breeze is sweet as the breath of the morn, in his fury not to be withstood, his rage the deluge, merciful in his feelings, his emotions relenting. Notice how this might, to us, seem like a strange sort of praise for the high god. He sounds almost unstable, or at the very least, fickle, and this is exactly the point. This has the form of a hymn of praise, but rather than praising his power directly, or his goodness, or some other more commonly praised aspect, the narrator is going to quite explicitly juxtapose his rage with his mercy to, in effect, praise the god for his fickleness, or, as we could perhaps more charitably call it, his unfathomableness. It may not be the usual thing anyone would praise a god for, but in proclaiming Marduk as exalted in both rage and mercy, the narrator exalts the god as being far removed from mortal recognition and mortal logic. We see this as the praise continues. Though the skies cannot sustain the weight of his hand, his gentle palm rescues the moribund. Marduk, the skies cannot sustain the weight of his hand, his gentle palm rescues the moribund. When he is angry, graves are dug, his mercy raised the fallen from disaster. When he glowers, protective spirits take flight, he has regard for and turns to the one whose God has forsaken him. Harsh is his punishments, he slaughters men in battles. When moved to mercy, he quickly feels pain like a mother in labor. 
He is bullheaded in love of mercy, like a cow with a calf. He keeps turning around watchfully. His scourge is barbed and punctures the body. His bandages are soothing. They heal the doomed. He speaks and makes one incur many sins. On the day of justice, sin and guilt are dispelled. He is the one who makes shivering and trembling. Through his sacred spell, chills and shivering are relieved. Who raises the flood of Adad, the blow of Era? Who reconciles the wrathful god and goddess? This is an aspect of Mesopotamian praise poetry in general, of both gods and kings, which can make the genre a bit inaccessible to modern readers. Why, you might ask, does the narrator insist on going on and on, belaboring the point that both his wrath and his mercy are limitless. Yes, we get it now. There exists one theory that people from many pre-literate cultures, both in the past and in modern day, have difficulty with abstract thinking. Not that they're any less natively intelligent, but that abstract thinking itself is a skill which must be first invented and then taught. In this view, the scribe may have learned a measure of abstraction in the process of becoming a literate priest, but either he's grasping at an abstraction that he can't quite put into words, or feels that it's necessary to talk around the abstraction with a listing of examples instead to help the audience understand his point. Of course, this is a controversial hypothesis, to say the least, extending into realms far beyond Babylonian poetry. And it could simply be argued that the narrator is so taken with religious devotion to Marduk that he simply can't shut up about him. The Lord divines the God's innermost thoughts, but no God understands his behavior. Marduk divines the God's innermost thoughts, but no God understands his behavior. As heavy his hand, so compassionate his heart. As brutal his weapons, so life-sustaining his feelings. Without his consent, who could cure his blow? Against his will, who could sin and escape? I will proclaim his anger, which runs deep like a fish. He punished me abruptly, then granted life. I will teach the people. I will instruct the land to fear. To be mindful of him is propitious to all. Here ends the hymn of praise, the direct prayer which prefaces the work. But now that we're entering the actual story part, in which the narrator explains how terrible his life has gotten, it is still a prayer of praise for Marduk. In learning of the narrator's suffering, we're praising Marduk's power, and in learning later of the narrator's redemption, we're still praising Marduk's power. After the Lord changed day into night, after the warrior Marduk became furious with me, my own god threw me over and disappeared. My goddess broke rank and vanished. He cut off the benevolent angel who walked beside me. My protective spirit was frightened off to seek out someone else. My vigor was taken away. My manly appearance became gloomy. My dignity flew off. My cover leapt away. Terrifying signs beset me. I was forced out of my house. I wandered outside, and my omens were confused. They were abnormal every day. The prognostication of diviner and dream interpreter could not explain what I was undergoing. What was said in the streets portended ill for me. When I lay down at nights, my dream was terrifying. The first thing to go when Marduk's wrath hits is the man's personal god. You may recall from previous episodes that a regular man would not directly worship Marduk on a regular basis. Marduk was simply too important for that. A king might have a relationship with Marduk, but most people established relationships with lesser gods and made them their personal god, devoting their life and worship most particularly to whichever personal god they selected, or whichever god they were selected by, depending on how you see it, religiously speaking. And we can see that as soon as the mighty Marduk has chased away this smaller god, the narrator immediately loses his dignity and vigor. His first response to any sort of indication that something was wrong was to visit the oracles and have his terrible dreams interpreted. But Marduk, as the Lord of Destinies, directly intervened to prevent the man from knowing what was going on, adding further to his suffering. 
we then hear of the first phase of his suffering, in which pretty much every social ill imaginable to a Babylonian befalls the narrator. An interesting listing that tells us a fair bit about social relations in Babylon. The king, incarnation of the gods, son of his people, his heart was enraged with me, and appeasing him was impossible. Courtiers were plotting hostile against me. They gathered themselves to instigate base deeds. The first says, I will make him end his life. Says the second, I ousted him from his command. So likewise the third, I will get my hands on his post. I will force his house, vows the fourth, and the fifth pants to speak, sixth and seventh follow in his train. The click of seven have massed their forces. Merciless as fiends equal to demons, so one is their body united in purpose, their hearts fulminate against me, ablaze like fire. Slander and lies, they try to lend credence against me. My mouth, once proud, was muzzled. My lips, which used to discourse, became those of a dead man. My resounding call struck dumb, my proud head bent earthward, my stout heart turned feeble for terror, my broad breast was brushed aside by a novice, my far-reaching arms pinned down by flimsy matting. I, who walked proudly, learned slinking. I, so grand, became servile. To my vast family I became a loner. As I went through the streets, ears were pricked up at me. I would enter the palace, eyes would squint at me. My city was glowering at me like an enemy. Belligerent and hostile would seem my land. My brother became my foe, my friend became a malignant demon. My comrade would denounce me savagely. My colleague was constantly keeping the taint of his weapons. My best friend would pinch off my life. My slave cursed me openly in the assembly of gentlefolk. My slave girl defamed me before the rabble. An acquaintance would see me and make himself scarce. My family disowned me. A pit awaited anyone speaking well of me, while he who was uttering defamation of me forged ahead. One who relayed base things about me had a god for his help. For the one who said, what a pity about him, death came early. The one of no help, his life became charmed. I had no one to go at my side, nor saw I a champion. They parceled my possessions among the riffraff. The sources of my waters they blocked with muck. They chased the harvest song from my fields. They left my community deathly still, like that of a ravaged foe. They let another assume my duties. They appointed an outsider to my prerogatives. So first society turns against him, then he loses the power to defend himself. Then those close to him turn against him, and no one is permitted to speak in his favor, lest they too be made to suffer. Finally, his possessions are taken, of which he counts his duties and responsibilities among these possessions. He doesn't respond well to this turn of events. By day sighing, by night lamentation. Monthly trepidation, despair the year. I moaned like a dove all my days. I let out groans as my song. My eyes are forced to look through constant crying. My eyelids are smarting through the tears. My face is darkened from the apprehensions of my heart. Terror and pain have jaundiced my face. The beat of my heart is quaking in ceaseless apprehension, my suffering like a burning fire. Like the bursting of a flame falsehood beset me. Constant is my lamentation, my imploring. The speech of my lips was senseless like a moron's. When I tried to talk, my conversation was gibberish. I watch that in daylight good will come upon me. The moon will change. The sun will shine. With this note of hope ends Tablet 1. But as Tablet 2 picks up, we see that not only is the sun refusing to shine, but all the usual methods for relieving ill fortune are coming to nothing. One whole year turned to the next. The normal time passed. As I turned around, it was more and more terrible. My ill luck was on the increase. I could find no good fortune. 
I called to my god, he did not show his face. I prayed to my goddess, she did not raise her head. The diviner with his inspection did not get to the bottom of it, nor did the dream interpreter with his incense clear up my case. I beseeched a dream spirit, but it did not enlighten me. The exorcist with his ritual did not appease divine wrath. What bizarre actions everywhere! I looked behind, persecution, harassment, like one who had not made libations to his god, nor invoked his goddess with a food offering, who was not wont to prostrate, nor seen to bow down, from whose mouth supplication and prayer were wanting, who skipped holy days, despised festivals, who was neglectful, omitted the god's rites, who had not taught his people reverence and worship, who did not invoke his god, but ate his food offering, who snubbed his goddess, brought her no flower offering. Like one possessed, who forgot his lord, who casually swore a solemn oath by his god, I indeed seemed such a one. I, for my part, was mindful of supplication and prayer. Prayer to me was the natural recourse, sacrifice my rule. The day for reverencing the gods was a source of satisfaction to me. The goddess's procession day was my profit and return. Praying for the king, that was my joy. His senate was for my own good omens. I instructed my land to observe the gods' rites. The goddess's name did I drill my people to esteem. I made my praises of the king like a god's, and I taught the population reverence for the palace. The narrator insists that he has done nothing wrong, and indeed has done everything right, leading him to a deep confusion, exclaiming, I wish I knew that these things were pleasing to a god. What seems good to oneself could be an offense to a god. What in one's own heart seems abominable could be good to one's god. Who could learn the reasoning of the gods in heavens? Who could grasp the intentions of the gods in the depths? Where might human beings have learned the ways of a god? He who lived by his brawn died in confinement. Suddenly, one is downcast in a trice full of cheer. One moment he sings in exultation. In a trice, he groans like a professional mourner. People's motivations change in a twinkling. Starving, they would become like corpses. Full, they would rival their gods. In good times, they speak of scaling heaven. When it goes badly, they complain of going down to hell. I have pondered these things. I've made no sense of them. But as for me, in despair, a whirlwind is driving me. There is a degree of literary parallelism going on here between the tablets, just as the first 40 or so lines of Tablet 1 were a hymn of praise to the god, the same set of lines in Tablet 2 are a discussion of how the narrator has been doing everything right, a hymn of praise to himself, if you will. And as social ills beset him from line 50 on down in Tablet 1, Tablet 2 lists physical ills that bring him to the brink of death. Debilitating disease is let loose upon me. An evil vapor has blown against me from the ends of the earth. Head pain has surged upon me from the breast of hell. A malignant specter has come forth from its hidden depths. A relentless ghost came out of its dwelling place. A she-demon came down from the mountain. Ague set forth with the flood and sea. Debility broke through the ground with the plants. They assembled their hosts. Together they came upon me. They struck my head. They closed around my pate. My features were gloomy. My eyes ran a flood. They wrenched my muscles, made my neck limp. They thwacked my chest and pounded my breast. They affected my flesh and threw me into convulsions. They kindled a fire in my stomach and churned up my bowels. They twisted my entrails, coughing and hacking infected my lungs. They infected my limbs, made my flesh pasty. My lofty stature they toppled like a wall. My robust figure they like a bulrush. I was dropped like a dried fig. I was tossed on my face. A demon had clothed himself in my body for a shirt. Drowsiness smothers me like a net. My eyes stare. They cannot see. My ears prick up, but they cannot hear. Numbness is spread over my whole body. Paralysis has fallen upon my flesh. Stiffness has seized my arms, and debility has fallen upon my loins. 
My feet forgot how to move. A stroke has overcome me. I choke like one fallen. Signs of death have shrouded my face. If someone thinks of me, I can't respond to the inquirer. Alas, they weep. I've lost consciousness. A snare is laid on my mouth, and a bolt bars my lips. My way in is barred. My point of slaking blocked. My hunger is chronic, but my gullet is constricted. If it be of grain, I choke it down like stinkweed. Beer, the sustenance of mankind, is sickening to me. Indeed, the malady drags on. For the lack of food, my features are unrecognizable. My flesh is waste, and my blood has run dry. My bones are loose, covered only with skin. My tissues are inflamed and inflicted with gangrene. I took to bed, confined. Going out was exhaustion. My house turned into my prison. My flesh was a shackle, my arms being useless. My person was a fetter, my feet having given way. My afflictions were grievous. The blow was severe. But it isn't just disease that comes upon him, but some sort of demonic torment as well. A scourge full of barbs thrashed me, a crop lacerated me, cruel with thorns. All day long tormentor would torment me, nor a night would he let me breathe freely a moment. From writhing my joints were separated, my limbs were splayed and thrust apart. I spent the night in my own dung like an ox, I wallowed in my excrement like a sheep. And as Tablet 2 closes, the hope that ended Tablet 1 has been completely snuffed out, with no one left to help the poor narrator. The exorcist recoiled from my symptoms, while my omens have perplexed the diviner. The exorcist did not clarify the nature of my complaint, while the diviner put no time limit on my illness. No god came to the rescue, nor lent me a hand. No goddess took pity on me, nor went at my side. My grave was open, my funerary goods were ready. Before I had died, lamentation for me was done. All my country said, how wretched he was, when my ill-wisher heard his face lit up. When the tidings reached her, my ill-wisher, her mood became radiant. The day grew dim for my whole family. For those who knew me, their sun grew dark. Now, tablets 3 and 4 have been damaged. Some of it can be reconstructed through inference, but some parts just have to be skipped over. Still, the opening of tablet 3 is preserved enough to be readable, and parallels the first two hymns of the first two tablets with a sequence of dreams, which were commonly taken as a form of direct communication from the gods that could be offered to anyone, from king all the way down to slave. Heavy was his hand upon me. I could not bear it. Dread of him was oppressive. His fierce punishment was like the deluge. Harsh, severe illness does not benefit my person. I lost sight of alertness. Illness makes my mind stray. I groan day and night alike. Dreaming and waking, I'm equally wretched. A remarkable young man of extraordinary physique. Magnificent in body, clothed in new garments. Because I was only half awake, his features lacked form, but he was clad in splendor and robed in dread. He came in upon me, he stood over me. When I saw him, my flesh grew numb. What the dream figure said is sadly lost, though it seems to have been comforting words. The narrator cries out to his people, likely meaning his family, but the poem continues that they were silent and did not speak. They heard me in silence and did not answer. The second time, I saw a dream. In the dream, I saw at night a remarkable purifier, holding in his hand a tamarisk rod of purification. Lalu Ralima, the sage, resident of Nippur, has sent me to cleanse you. He was carrying water. He poured it over me. He pronounced the resuscitating incantation, and he massaged my body. The second dream is almost certainly a description of what a medical healing ritual would have looked like, with perhaps healing herbs involved in either the water or the massage. A third time I saw a dream. In my dream I saw at night a remarkable young woman in shining countenance, clothed like a person, being like a god, a queen among peoples. She entered upon me and sat down beside me. 
She ordered my deliverance. Fear not, she said. Part of the speech is lost here, but then she ordered my deliverance. Most wretched indeed is he, whoever he might be, the one who saw the vision at night. In the dream was Ur Nintanuga, a Babylonian healer, a bearded young man wearing a tiara. He was an exorcist, carrying a tablet. Marduk has sent me. To you, Shabshi Meshresh Sakan, I have brought suave. From his pure hands, I have brought a suave. He has entrusted me into the hands of my ministrant. With this third dream of healing, having now been visited by a god, a priest doctor, and an exorcist, the illness breaks. In waking hours, he sent a message. He revealed his favorable sign to my people. I awoke in my sickness, a healing serpent slithered by. This serpent is the same medical symbol that can still be seen on the staff of Asclepius, which adorns many hospitals even today. My illness was quickly over. My fetters were broken. After my lord's heart had quieted, after the feelings of merciful Marduk were appeased, and he had accepted my prayers, his sweet relenting was a blessing. He ordered my deliverance. He made the wind hear away my offenses. A chunk is missing now. Surviving single words suggest that there is some worship going on to expunge the narrator's guilt and transgression. The latter half of Tablet 3 appears to be a reflection of the physical ailments in Tablet 2, in which someone, possibly Marduk himself, comes to cure his illness. He applied to me his spell, which binds debilitating disease. He drove back the evil vapor to the ends of the earth. He bore off the head pain to the breast of hell. He sent down the malignant specter to its hidden depths. The relentless ghost he returned to its dwelling. He overthrew the she-demon, sending her off to a mountain. He replaced the ague in flood and sea. He eradicated debility like a plant. Uneasy sleep excessive drowsiness. He dissipated like smoke filling the sky. The turning towards people with woe and alas, he drove away like clouds. The tenacious disease in the head which was heavy as a millstone, he raised like dew of night. He removed it from me. My beclouded eyes, which were wrapped in the shroud of death, he drove the cloud a thousand leagues away. He brightened my vision. My ears, which were stopped and clogged like a deaf man's, he removed their blockage, he opened my hearing. My nose, whose breathing was choked by symptoms of fever, he soothed its affliction so I could breathe freely. My babbling lips, which had taken on a hard crust, he wiped away their distress and undid their deformation. My mouth, which was muffled so that proper speech was difficult, he scoured like copper and removed its filth. My teeth, which were clenched and locked together firmly, he opened their fastening, freed the jaws. My tongue, which was tied and could not converse, he wiped off its coating and its speech became fluent. My windpipe, which was tight and choking, as though on a gobbet, he made well and let it sing its songs like a flute. My gullet, which was so swollen it could not take food, its swelling went down and he opened its blockage. It seems things are turning out well for our narrator as we move into the fourth and final tablet. This one, too, would have been 120 lines, probably with substantial parallels to the previous four, but it exists only as fragments, plus a handful of lines quoted by other authors in other works commenting on this one. These may or may not actually fit in with the translation that we're working on, but they tend to get stuck in by modern translators because they do seem to work. The tablet probably begins with, The Lord saved me. The Lord took hold of me. The Lord set me on my feet. The Lord revived me. He rescued me from the pit. He summoned me from destruction. He pulled me from the river of death. He took my hand. He who smote me, Marduk, he restored me. It was Marduk who made him drop his weapon. He turned away the attack of my foe. This would likely parallel the praise that began each tablet, though much is missing. The next two lines don't actually come from the text itself, but as quotes from a later commentary, at the place of the river ordeal, where people's fates are decided, I was struck on the forehead, 
my slave marks removed. This makes good enough sense in context. The river ordeal, as you may recall, is where folks are chucked into the Euphrates, possibly while tied to a weight, and should they swim far enough under the water before surfacing, then the gods have judged them to be innocent. On the other hand, the narrator was never actually enslaved in the tablets we currently possess, suggesting that this is either a metaphorical release from slavery, or that there were multiple, slightly different versions of the Luddell in circulation in the ancient world. Following this, the narrator is restored in a more mystical sense, following the physical restorations of Tablet 3, and inextricably intertwined with this gift is the narrator's own exuberant prayers. With prostration and supplication to Isaglia, I, who went down to the grave, have returned to the gate of sunrise. In the gate of prosperity, prosperity was given to me. In the gateway of the guardian spirit, a guardian spirit drew nigh to me. In the gate of well-being, I beheld well-being. In the gates of life, I was granted life. In the gate of sunrise, I was reckoned among the living. In the gate of splendid wonderment, my signs were plain to see. In the gate of release from guilt, I was released from my bond. In the gate of petition, my mouth made inquiry. In the gate of release from sighing, my sighs were released. In the gate of pure water, I was sprinkled with purifying water. In the gate of conciliation, I appeared with Marduk. In the gate of joy, I kissed the foot of Sarpanitum. What are these gates? Are they metaphors for something? Are they physical places? Are they aspects of a ritual? It could be all three, or none, or some combination. I can't figure it out. I was assiduous in supplication and prayer before them. I placed fragrant incense before them. An offering, a gift, sundry donations I presented. Many fatted oxen I slaughtered, butchered many sheep. Honey-sweet beer and pure wine I repeatedly libated. The protecting genius, the guardian spirit, divine attendants of the fabric of Asaglia, I made their feelings glow with libation. I made them exultant with lavish meals, to the threshold, the bolt socket, the bolt, the doors. I offered oil, butterfat, the choicest grain, for the rites of the temple. Here we see a temple ritual, in which the narrator gives thanks to the gods by giving them presents, as much as he can afford and more. If this is meant as a literary version of something that actually happened to the author, we could see quite clearly that he was a very wealthy man. If the narrator is a purely literary character, as some expect, then this is simply showing off him performing his obligations with as much elaborate excess as he had previously described the depths of his own suffering. I proceeded along Kanush Kadru Street in a state of redemption. He who has done wrong by a saglia, let him learn from me. It was Marduk who put a muzzle on the mouth of the lion that was devouring me. Marduk took away the sling of my pursuer and deflected the sling stone. This section comes from another unrelated text and presents itself as a quote from the Ludlow in order that this other author might make comments upon it. Here we see in four lines the moral of the story. If the gods are angry with you, it is from there that your punishment will come, and it is only by the grace of the gods that your punishment can be lifted. But we'll look at that a bit more after this last fragment. The final surviving fragment ends with a great feast, presumably one set up by the narrator in honor of Marduk. At the end of the feast, all Babylonians come together to acknowledge the miracle which occurred and praise Marduk's greatness. With golden grain, he anointed himself with sweet cedar perfume upon him, a feast for the Babylonians. His tomb he has made was set up for a feast. The Babylonians saw how Marduk can restore to life, and all mouths proclaimed his greatness. Who would have said he would see his son? Who would have imagined that we would pass through his street? Who but Marduk revived him as he was dying? Beside Sarpanitum, which goddess bestowed his breath of life? Marduk can restore to life from the grave. Sarpanitum knows how to rescue from annihilation.
Wherever earth is founded, heavens are stretched wide. Wherever sun shines, fire ablazes. Wherever water runs, wind blows. Those whose bits of clay Aruru pinched off to form them, those endowed with life who walk upright, teeming mankind as many as they may be, give praise to Marduk. From all who can speak, proclaim, may he rule all the peoples, may he be shepherd of all habitations. The final lines are too damaged to read, but they seem to continue with the praise of Marduk. There is far more that can be read into this than I have time or cleverness to pick apart for this show, but the core of this work is pretty simple. The narrator did nothing wrong, and was properly pious, but Marduk became upset with him. There are some who think that Marduk got mad for literally no reason at all, and this is fine because he's a mighty god and he can do whatever he wants. There are some who think that Marduk got mad for some unfathomably obscure reason, and this too is fine, since the minds of the gods are far beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. Either way, the answer to the question of why bad things happen to good people is that they simply do. Sometimes you can identify a reason for it, but sometimes you can't. All blessings flow from the gods, and so too does all suffering. A child might tear apart an insect, maybe because he's bored, maybe because he's cruel, maybe because he wants the wing for decoration or as an ingredient for medicine, or maybe for no reason at all. But any of these motivations are incomprehensible to the insect. And so, should suffering befall you, dear listener, remember that there are plenty of remedies you can try, and they are all worth trying. But none of them will work so long as the god you offended remains angry at you. All you can do to soothe this god is offer ceaseless pieties. These words and gifts are not guaranteed to change the god's mind, but they are necessary if the god's mind is going to change. The god may not change right away, but keep at it, and he may become favorable to you again and restore you to good favor. This is envisioned no differently from an angry friend, lover, boss, or king. Should you offend a mortal, you can do nothing but ceaselessly demonstrate your devotion and good intentions and hope they stop being mad at you. Though, of course, Marduk's wrath is far greater than even a spurned lover's. For all its literary flourish, the Luttle is at heart a hymn in praise of Marduk and a moral lesson to those who worship him. It may well be one of the greatest literary productions of the old Babylonian period, and will continue to be sung out and studied for centuries to come. Next week, however, I have one more tale of old Babylon for you, one quite different from the highly composed literary narrative of Ludlow. By fortunate happenstance, one particular soldier, serving sometime around the year 1700 BCE, left a cache of 21 letters that came to be recovered and translated in the 1950s, allowing us to narrate a few incidents about his life and reconstruct other aspects of it through other sources. And so, before returning to the history of kings and nations, join us next week for a look at the biography of a little man, the soldier Ubarum, as he navigates the challenges of daily life in the old Babylonian period. Thank you for listening.